So what is the future of humanity and artificial intelligence? If we look into the near future and the distant future, there's a lot of people who have very dystopian views of how this might look. Um, what are your views on this? Are they, are they um, dark or dystopian or are they optimistic? So first of all, in terms of ordinary artificial intelligence of the sort that most people see and have seen for a long time <clears throat> of the sort that I did as a researcher, I see that as accumulating gradually, improving steadily, and having a long road still to go. So um, that sort of process looks like it will give you plenty of warning <laughs> before you have bigger problems to deal with. Uh, so we're a long way away from machines being able to do most everything humans do, perhaps even centuries. and. You know, as they start to become more capable, then they will basically take up a larger fraction of world income. Hmm. The, the key signature of AI getting more capable is you pay it more money <laughs> instead of people. So because most income goes to pay people today, you can be pretty sure that people are the main valuable thing today. But later on, with time, we will pay more and more for the machines and the software because they'll be doing the important things. And then eventually they'll do most things. There's a long way to go before that. And that process will be pretty gradual. That is, I don't foresee a sudden change where all of a sudden, you know, people, humans were doing, you know, half the jobs yesterday and next week they're doing almost nothing, right? That, but it, the scale, the, the timeline isn't necessarily linear in a sense that it, the exponential growth of tech, the, the growth of technology becomes exponential, right? Like what we did in the last 100 years compared to the next 100 years will be extremely sped up. Well, um, I actually think you should think in terms of a log normal distribution over task difficulty, which is a, a mouthful, I guess. So the idea is the difficulty of tasks in automating is varies enormously. So, you know, they are spread across a very wide spectrum in terms of how difficult tasks are to automate. So, okay. you know, as you know, Moore's law for a while, you know, computers got twice as cheap every two years. Right. Um, but we didn't see an exponential displacement of humans from jobs, even as technology was increasing exponentially. Uh, that is, we've seen a relatively linear, steady displacement of jobs, even though technology is uh, increasing exponentially. Okay. And a way to understand that is to imagine there's a, a distribution for each job of how hard it is, how much computing power does it take to automate that job? And think of it in terms of many, many orders of magnitudes, right? So if it was a number like some jobs take one and some takes 10 and 10 take 100 and 1,000 and a you know, million and a billion, and that jobs are spread really far across this really wide range of difficulty. <laughs> you know, so the very first machines automated some very simple jobs that people were doing. And then over time, as computers have gotten better, and cheaper, we've been able to automate more jobs by moving up that spectrum. Like first it was the jobs that only had a difficulty of one, and then the jobs have 10, and then the jobs that have 100. But the idea is the range is, is really wide. Like right. there's jobs up at a trillion and a jobs at a quadrillion, right. right? And so that's why even as technology has been improving exponentially, the fraction of jobs that the machines do has not been increasing exponentially because the difficulty of job is just really widely spread. And at the moment, we are, you know, automating a new set of jobs that we couldn't automate 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, we have just a little, still really a long way to go. And so that would be my picture for the ordinary kind of AI that we've seen so far. Now, my book, The Age of M, is about a somewhat different kind of AI. And that different kind of AI has more of a threshold effect where nothing happens until something happens and then a lot suddenly happens. Uh, and that's the idea of a brain emulation. So you have a brain in your head and it has a whole bunch of cells of different types which are connected to each other with little wires and there's a system by which when signals come into your eyes or your hand, it goes to the brain and they go, signals go through the cells and each cell takes signals in and sends signals out. And we could, in principle, copy that whole system in your brain and make a computer model of a brain like yours that has 
you know, a substitute for each cell and a model of how each cell works that send, takes signals in and sends signals out that sends it to the other cells, just like in your brain. And if we could make a brain emulation of your brain, then it would behave just like you in the same situation. And that would be powerful human level artificial intelligence. We are a long way from being able to do that, but we will sometime in the next few centuries be able to do that. And we might, I think, be able to do that before we can do other kinds of human level artificial intelligence. And this kind of AI has a threshold. That is, when we make this emulation of your brain, say we get it wrong, like the cell models are off or the connections are off. If it's wrong enough, it just won't work. It'll just be mush. It'll just be a mess. Yeah. But once we pass a threshold of it, the model being close enough to you, then it'll basically work. And so that's this threshold where brain emulations before a certain point, they're just not really valuable at all. And then after a certain point, they're really valuable. And then that would have more of a sudden transition into this world where brain emulations were cheap and common. Mm -hmm. And that's what my book is all about is what that world looks like. Have you ever seen the movie or the show Westworld? On HBO? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, that is almost exactly uh, what Westworld is about, right? It's about a park. Can you explain? Right. Well, so the, I mean, initially, it was a movie long ago when I was a kid. It was also a, mo a <laughs> right. movie long ago, right. yeah. Right. And so the idea is it's an amusement park where there are robots to entertain the guests. And they don't really specify how the robots are designed. So, in fact, in the TV show Westworld, they also have brain emulations later in the show as a different thing. And so the, the robots in Westworld are not brain emulation robots, but they are AI that are very effectively similar to humans. So they present them as very human-like <clears throat> AI, right? Uh, even though they're apparently not designed that way. Uh, and, and of course, it's crazy stupid like a lot of fiction is. If you could actually make those robots as they made them in that show, you wouldn't mainly use them in an amusement park. <laughs> You'd use them everywhere in the economy. I mean, so the, the key thing is human workers are get more than half of world income. So if you could have a substitute for human workers, you can make trillions of dollars basically replacing human workers with it. So the idea that you would just use that in an amusement park and nowhere else is kind of crazy. Well, the idea, the, the main incentive for Westworld, correct me if I'm wrong, I may be misinterpreting it. It's been a while, but I believe the main incentive of it was to um, longevity, right? To, to live forever to be able to learn enough from these real humans that were interacting with them to be able to copy them, to copy their minds. So when their uh, biological body dies, they can take that copy and put it in a, a cyborg or a so, so robot. Th there were three main lines of business that I recall from Westworld <laughs> TV show. One, the, the first main line of business was these entertainment of the amusement park. Right. Okay. A second line of business was they were trying to make uploads and I believe they showed that as failing. That is, they just didn't work. And then the third secret line of business that they reveal later on is that they are watching the visitors to the park very closely and therefore learning to predict human behavior. And somehow the idea is that the val that was much more valuable than just having human level robots. So somehow, because somehow you could market to them, right? You could send them right, advertisements right. and predict what they do. And so in the later seasons, they have these big spherical computers that are yes. predicting the world. What, is, what will everybody yeah. will do, right? As if that was some enormously economically valuable thing compared to the robots, which that seems crazy. Because like <laughs> people predicting future behavior, that the moment that doesn't command much income in the world. There's not a lot of demand for that. There is some, but it's not that big. But people working, there's a huge demand for that. The world is full of people working. And if you can substitute for people working, you can make trillions. Right. I don't think you can make trillions just because you can predict what TV show somebody will watch next or which way they will turn on the street. There's just not that much money there. But it sets up this dystopian thing. Oh, my God. You know, they can predict what I'll do. I just feel dehumanized now. Right. So the show went for this emotional threat of you feeling threatened by the fact that a machine can predict you as the emotional anchor of the show, as opposed to these machines can take your jobs. Mm -hmm.